So there's this interesting moment when that first caveman, that first capitalist, drew a line, a circle in this cave and said, you know, this is mine. You could say it was free to be claimed at the mm -hmm. time he claimed it. Yeah. But it's an interesting moment when uh, asset becomes an asset, when space-time, as you were referring to it, becomes something that's now can be possessed by a human being. Mm -hmm. Is there something special about this moment? Because it feels like, first of all, in terms of space and time, it feels like there's a lot of available space-time yet to be claimed. <laughs> so if we just look at like the universe, right? We're talking about, there's a funny thing with uh, with Elon Musk and Mars. I think they s sneaked in there for SpaceX that uh, nobody on earth has any authority on Mars or any, <laughs> or this is a very interesting question. It seems almost like humorous at this time, but perhaps not. Perhaps there'll be sections of space, not just on planets that are gonna be even fought over. So is there something special about this moment? Because in discussing sort of violence and respect for property, mm. it feels like this is a special moment uh, because uh, ultimately conflict arises when you make claims on a particular territory. It's, you know, it's not always in conflict where people say, when you look at Hitler or something, for example, mm. his claim would be in many of the lands that he attacked and invaded, that this is ultimately, this has always belonged to Germany. Mm -hmm. So is there something you could say as to like what it means to own an asset or a property? Yeah. So in the ancient days of hunters and gatherers, we could say that property was mostly a loyal title, which meant it's just whatever you can defend, right? So if you've got knives and daggers and satchels and you know maybe some pelts you've, you've hunted, whatever you can hold and defend is yours. That's and and there's not like there's a government to appeal to. You know, you're just sort of a free agent operating in the wild, defending the assets you can protect on you, more or yeah. less. Um, and what really changed the nature of property is when we get into the agricultural age. So there, there's a big flip where we went from just foraging and hunting all the time, constantly moving, trying to stay alive, to deciding we're going to settle here. We figured out how to cultivate crops. We can create, uh, you know, we can increase the population because we can harvest more energy from the sun and we can establish a longer term civilization. What happens in that transition is that we begin creating economic surplus. So for the first time in history, we have, you know, grain, uh, uh, stock houses of grain to defend or maybe meat or cattle or whatever it is we're creating. We now have savings. Mm -hmm. And it's at that time when government emerges as well. Because once you have savings or you have an economic surplus, you have something that other people want to steal, right? This, this one thing we'll touch on a lot today is people always want something for nothing. There's always, people are always seeking the path to get something for nothing. And I think that drives a lot of our decision-making. And it actually encourages us to be innovative in a lot of ways, right? We're trying to... Um, it, it, you could say it's our laziness that's helping us be inventive in a way. We're trying to accomplish greater results with less efforts over time. But the, we can cross that line in seeking something for nothing where we start to violate the life, liberty, and property of others. And that's where we shift from kind of capitalistic society to, to something more communistic. And so that's what government is. It's a protection-producing enterprise for the economic surplus generated by a trading society. So when people begin to trade, uh, they create what's called the division of labor, which is a very common economics term. Basically means you're better at making hats, I'm better at making boots. If you and I, if you specialize in hats, I specialize in boots and we trade, we've created a positive sum game where you and I both benefit. So we become collectively more than the sum of our parts through trade. And that's why human beings do trade because we become more energy efficient as a result. We create more outputs per unit of input. And you could think of government in that respect, if we're looking at it, maybe in a tech sense, that the economy is the trade network that generates wealth, generates innovation, generates all this whole lap of luxury we live in today that we've inherited from our forebears is from the market. It's not from a government. The government is the network security. 
if you will. <laughs> so we're, ex- yeah. we're, we're paying expenses to a vendor to protect peace, to preserve life, liberty, and property in that network so that we can have, you know, when there's inevitably disputes over private property, we can have nonviolent dispute resolution uh, in the rule of law. Um, and we can have a reasonable expectation of, of being able to conduct commerce without violence. The problem has been that the protector tends to, you know, they're in a monopolistic position, we would say. They tend to start abusing that position to obtain uh, property for themselves. Again, trying to get that something for nothing. When you control, you know, you are the security guard for the economy. The first thing they tend to monopolize is money. Because if you can control the money, you're effectively controlling people, their energy, their perceptions. Um, And that becomes a, you know, particularly through inflation, becomes an avenue to get something for nothing. And that you can just print more money that everyone else is forced to sacrifice their time and energy to obtain. What what are your thoughts about anarchism? So um, I talk quite a bit, he'll be here in a few days actually, Michael Malice, about ideas of anarchy. And his idea, or the idea of anarchists is that any amount of government will eventually become the very kind of thing that mm-hmm. you're referring to. Mm-hmm. So there's almost no way to have a government that doesn't then try to um, monopolize power, mm-hmm. money, and all those kinds mm-hmm. of things. Do you think it's possible to have a government sort of on that spectrum of like anarchy, maybe libertarianism? I'm not sure how exactly the spectrum goes, but where you have a small government that protects the liberty and property rights and those kinds of things and doesn't expand to then also control the the monetary system and all those other uh, things. Agreed, is it possible? agreed completely. It was not possible until Satoshi Nakamoto. So for the first time in history, we have a money that cannot be monopolized, cannot be corrupted, cannot be changed, um, cannot be weaponized, frankly. Our current monetary system is weaponized by those who can print money against those who cannot. Um, and I think when you have, you know, at the heart of every modern economy, which even we could say the US, we pride ourselves as free market capitalist. You know, we outcompeted communism in the 20th century. We think that this is the superior model. Um, most business people will tell you that the free market is the best allocator of resources, all of these things. But what we have at the heart of every modern economy, including the US, is an anti capitalistic institution, which is the central bank. Um, the temptation to monopolize money throughout all of history has been too strong for anyone to resist. So any, even benevolent, quote unquote, dictators that have taken over, many dictators have inherited, say, an inflationary regime or society's coming apart because someone was clipping the coins or someone was printing too much money and they'll commit to going back to a hard money standard. So they'll keep society on a a gold standard, for instance, such that they cannot violate um, the money to benefit themselves. But inevitably over time, because it is a political institution, there's an incentive there, right? For, for again, to get something for nothing, to spend more than you're making through tax revenues. And with that incentive, people typically ultimately end up pursuing that inflationary path. 